Both of you together will be glad that you are here together and that God will have been pleased with your worship and you'll have been pleased and blessed with what he shared with you today and we're expecting God to move. Um, I believe every time we come, God is present and if we listen, he'll, he'll, he'll speak to us and he'll touch our hearts and help us to grow and learn things and, you know, I just, I just get excited about worship. I think it's a great thing. Um, I want to make a couple of announcements and I think Joel's on his way down. Yeah, you've got to come over here because you've got to make the one. Um, one of them has to do with um, the little prayer cards. You may remember last week I invited you to write down initials. For anybody that you know, that you care about, that uh, doesn't attend church, doesn't know the Lord, somebody that you've got on a prayer list for salvation or for God to touch their hearts and get them on board, and we're going to make a, a prayer list that we share out of it. All you have to do is write down initials, and then we're going to include in the prayer. Uh, some people weren't here last week, so you may not know that. There's these blue regular prayer cards that are on the ends of the pews, so if you want to fill one out and just put initials on it, that's what will happen to it. It'll go onto that list. You don't have have to say it's from you or anything, but just people that we're going to as a body be praying for, for God to touch. And so I invite you to remember to do that. Joel's going to come and share a little bit about tonight's meal, I hope. How many of you remember that there's a meal tonight at the park? Okay. I don't care. <laughs> just. Well, just as a reminder, we have the church picnic tonight. And we're providing hot dogs and hamburgers, and so if everybody that comes would bring just a side dish or salad, and we're going to also have some games and things going on. And there's still some invitations in the back behind uh, Betty Adams, so if you want to still invite somebody, you can still use those cards to do that. And so we hope you'll all come, and uh, it's supposed to be nice weather this evening, so it won't be too hot or too cold. So hope to see you tonight. Super. All right, so Fremont Park at 5. Bring somebody. You know, bring, bring somebody whose initials you've written down. We're not, it's, not, it's going to be a real low threat thing, real low key thing. Had a conversation with somebody this week and, and, and we were talking about this picnic and I just want to make sure you realize this. This isn't like a fancy potluck. Don't feel like you've got to come up with the perfect dish or the best casserole or your you know what it's going to take a lot of work. I mean, grab a bag of potato chips to bring if you want to, you know, or stop and pick up some, make some coleslaw, or pick up some. You'll know, make it simple for yourself. Come and have fun, is is the goal. So don't so uh, plan on it that way. For our call to worship this morning, we have just we're just doing a musical call to worship. So if you'd stand with me, we are going to uh, open with the "I Will Enter" gates number two hundred and fourteen. God, as we gather this morning, we come for you to make us glad. Not the circumstances of our life, not the opportunities that come, not the emotional up and downs that we experience, but we come into your presence for our joy and gladness, seeking God for you to work in our hearts. Lord, we rejoice for the opportunity to be in your very presence. Thank you for inviting us to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Say hi to a few folks before you be seated, if you would, or before we sing, I guess.
I'll share with you that Jim is not feeling good today, and Brad and Brad's sharing the sermon today, so you stuck with me over here. I thought I was not going to get to do much, but so I'm covering for Jim, and we are going to sing the first, second, and fourth and fifth verse of Amazing Grace, and then we're going to move right along. Sing it to the Lord like you mean it. Number 338, continuing on the theme of grace, wonderful grace of Jesus. We'll do all three verses of this one.
And finally, the Lily of the Valley, 626, first and last stanzas. you be seated. That one doesn't necessarily match the theme of grace, but it's one of my favorites. I'll be singing that chorus for a week now, so I wanted to throw that one in. At this time, I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward as we continue to worship by giving of our tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the sun shining. We thank you for another opportunity to share the mission of your church, the mission that you've given to each and every one of us to spread hope, to spread your, spread your love and peace from this place out into the world. Lord, you know the resources that are required to do that. And so God, we know that you are going to equip us with all that we need and so I pray today as we give that you would bless each giver and each gift to your work and to your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen.
Prayer our time of prayer, um, and I'll have the deacons come as we do. Although Brad has a portable mic, so I'm going to read them from up here, and then we'll pray down there. Okay, in addition, uh, we're going to take our little moment. Brad, Brad hasn't been here when we've done a centering time, and I said, yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll do this. Um, but, you know, again, we just, there's so much that goes on in our lives. And I don't know about you, but I, I already am thinking about places I've got to go this afternoon or this evening, um, thinking about somebody I still want to catch for this barbecue. You know, all that stuff we have to lay aside and just let go and center in and focus on what God might want to say today. So just take a few minutes for whatever it takes for you to lay those things aside and, and bring your hearts close to God. Amen. Well, this morning, if you want to follow along, I'm going to be uh, preaching from John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18, which, uh, as I look back, I think I preached about last Christmas, right before uh, the Christmas before Pastor Richard came. It tends to be more of a, a Christmas scripture, I think, sometimes, but I, it sets the tone, in my opinion, for the life of Jesus. And so uh, when Pastor Richard asked me if I would preach this morning and I knew what he was going to be talking about, this w was immediately what I wanted to talk about, grace upon grace. So John chapter 1 verses 14 through 18 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him, talking about John the Baptist. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, he has made him known. Now over the years in Fremont, I've had the opportunity to work with lots of, of young people. Uh, Fremont, not quite so much. I was a youth pastor, but we didn't have all of the other opportunities that Fremont has to work with young people. And so I've had the chance to, to work with people, young people from different agencies, young people from all over uh, the state and really all over our nation in different capacities. But there was an opportunity that I had that still weighs very heavily on my heart. And this was last summer uh, when we were doing some projects with Rebuilding Together and we had a chance to work uh, with a group of, of young kids from uh, the Jefferson House. And there was one particular young man that I had a, a special affinity for, and I'm not sure why. It's just that God had, had really laid him on my heart. And he liked to spend time with me and I liked to spend time with him. And so he often spent time volunteering with me, and he put in long, hard days uh, working with us. He helped us do some painting, and he would do funny things. One day, he decided to paint his chest with exterior paint. The dumbest thing I've ever seen, uh, but I turned my face for one minute, and here's this kid all covered in paint. I said, that's not going to come off as pain painlessly as you think it might. But he just did funny things, and I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with him. Well, there was one day when nobody else from the Jefferson house really felt like coming out. It was hot, and they had been painting for a long time, and they wanted to take a break. But this guy wanted to come out and spend the day with me. And so I said, that's fine. I'll come and get you. So to make a long story short, that day we had spent the day together working, and we went back to the office, um, and I just needed to do a few things before I took him back to the Jefferson house. And so I left him in my office by himself. We had spent all this time together, 
And what I wanted to do was give him the opportunity. Some people think I'm naive, but I want to give people the opportunity to do the right thing. I want to give people the opportunity to earn my trust. And so I went and did my things for a few minutes and came back into the office. And I said, well, let's, let's go. I need to take you back. And so we're sitting in the pickup and we're heading back to the Jefferson house. And I asked him how things were going. And he said, well, things are going pretty good. But he said, you know, I really just want to quit being such a screw up was exactly the words that he used. And so we talked for a long, long time about making choices and that you have the opportunity to change your life. You just have to exercise some self-control and that, that he could make those changes. Well, the whole time this young man was sitting in my presence, he had taken my cell phone off of my desk and the cell phone was in his pocket. And I think it was an admission of guilt. I think he felt sorry for what he was doing. I may be naive, maybe he didn't care. But I think he was feeling bad for what he was doing, what had happened. And, and he was just trying to figure out how to get out of it. He was looking for grace. Now this event started a chain reaction that, that began a downward spiral for him. I wish I could tell you there was a happy ending, but I tried to, to talk to him, but he was too ashamed to, to speak with me, and then he got himself into a little bit more trouble and ended up in a group home in Omaha, and then he took off. And no one knew where he was at for weeks and weeks. I would call and say, have you found him? And no one had found him. And at, at this point, nobody knows for sure. I'm sure he's been found and he's someplace safe. But because of privacy laws, none of us really know. And so it's really on my heart because I have no idea what he's doing or where he's at. I never had the opportunity to extend grace to this young man. But I think before he decided to act out of fear, my prayer was that I was going to have the opportunity. I said to his, uh, the group home leaders, I said, I just want the opportunity to look him in the face and tell him that God loves him and that I love him and he can still continue to, to work on not being the screw-up that he said that he didn't want to be anymore, that everything was going to be fine because it's easy to pass judgment and fear is the opposite of grace. And I wanted to give him grace, but this young man had done nothing but live in fear all of his life. And so even when I wanted to give him grace, he just couldn't sit in front of me and look him in the eye. And it kept reconciliation from happening. And so I continue to pray that someday that's going to happen. Now, Pastor Richard has been talking a lot over these past weeks about sharing Jesus with others. But I think one of the biggest roadblocks that we have to sharing Jesus, to evangelizing, to bringing hope to the world, is this lack of grace. A lack of, of being able to extend forgiveness to people even when they have wronged us. Yet I think grace is the key to Jesus. And, and I think that is shown right here in the first part of John when it talks about him coming into the world and him being full of grace and truth. It's, it's the key to Jesus. It's the key to salvation because if it wasn't for grace, we wouldn't have salvation. We can't earn it. It's given to us. And it's the key to discipleship. If we want people to know who Jesus is, if Jesus was the very embodiment, as this Scripture tells us, of God's grace, then grace has to be the key to us sharing God and sharing the love of Jesus with others. So it's the key to Jesus, and it's something that we talk about often, but I think it's something we have a very difficult time putting into practice. Grace is hard. These verses tell us that grace is why God chose to leave the heavenly realms and come and pitch His tent among us. That was the reason. Yet years of violence and war show that we as His creation have learned little from His example. We have a hard time pitching our tent with people who need grace. People who need God's love. And we forget that, that even though maybe I've never stolen a cell phone, I've lied I've cheated on a test. I think probably many of us have done that at some point in our lives. I've murdered because I've sown hate in my heart. And I have to learn from that example as well. 
So verse 14 tells us that grace came to us in the form of Jesus. It says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth, not fractions of grace and truth, not incomplete grace and truth, but full of grace and truth. In the life of Jesus that's portrayed in the Gospels, we see the fullness of grace and truth. Grace and truth need to be together because I think the only way we can experience grace is by knowing the truth. Knowing the truth of God's love for us in such that He would leave heaven and come and be with us and show grace as we're going to talk about in a few minutes to many people. We have lots and lots and lots of examples of Jesus showing grace. So we can't know grace unless we know truth. But the only way we can understand truth is by living in the light of grace. Because grace is truth. Yet the use of the word and lets us know that they are two different concepts. So truth, if we look at that, truth can be defined as that which is in accordance with fact or reality. Truth is true. There's one truth. We all value truth. I have always told my kids that lying is detestable. We have a hard time trusting somebody that lies to us. We value truth. It was truth that this young man had stolen my cell phone. That was truth. We found out he had taken it. It was found in his room. He had stolen my cell phone. Yet grace, on the other hand, is defined by Christians as unmerited favor. Truth is reality. It's always there. We can find truth. Something is always true. But grace is a gift. Grace is always available, but grace isn't always given. And grace isn't always accepted. You see, I knew the truth. He had taken my phone, and so often that's where we stop. We're people of truth. He took my phone, he made his bed, he has to lay in it, I have no sympathy for him, somebody has to pay for his crime. But I'm telling you that oftentimes, truth without grace leads to wrath, it leads to revenge, it leads to, to somebody's got to pay. But I'm just reminded constantly when I'm, when I'm thinking about this young man that, that if God had the same attitude towards me, I'd be in trouble. If God had truth in Jesus without grace, all of us would be in trouble. And so I'm forced to have sympathy for Him because God had sympathy for me. Grace is a choice. Truth is always present, but grace must be given. It can't be earned. It can't be bought. It has to be given. So important is grace that, that John, if you remember what I just read, calls upon the testimony of John the Baptist. He says, I'm not the only one who's told you this. John the Baptist told you this. In verse 14, he calls upon that testimony. And so the testimony of these two Johns joined together declare that Jesus is the divine glory of God on display for all humankind to see. Jesus is God. He is the fullness of God. The fullness of God. Everything that God is, is embodied in this man, Jesus Christ. And He's here for all of us to see. And then it tells us that Christ was going to be the ultimate dispenser of grace. And we see it over and over again in the Scriptures. Out of His fullness, out of His fullness of God, we have received grace in place of grace already given. It was given to you. You didn't ask for it. You didn't earn it. You can't buy it. There's no word that you can say that makes you get it. It's something that was given for you. You, this endless, non-diminishing supply of grace upon grace upon grace. After this grace is over, there's another grace waiting to fill the vacuum. And truth isn't mentioned again. Only grace. And I believe that's because grace is truth. 
Grace is truth. Churches argue endlessly about baptism and communion and the atonement and how do we do this and how do we do that and how do we know what truth is? Because we got a thousand different churches telling us a thousand different things. But there is one thing that every single one of us agree on. And that's that the love of, and grace of God is embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. Every one of us agree that grace is truth. That the love of God is truth. 1 Corinthians tells us that the greatest of all is love. John 13 tells us that if we want the world to know Jesus, and I've said this before, but this is the concept, people. If we want the world to know Jesus, we have to show love. People don't come to our churches because we have a hard time loving one another, let alone loving the world. But yet Jesus says if you show love, people are going to want to come. They're going to want to be among you. First John tells us that if we say we love God, yet we hate someone, we're a liar. We must have compassion and love and grace for all, no matter what the offense, because God has compassion and love and grace for me and for you, no matter what our offense is. And as Christians, we're trying to be like Jesus to the best of our ability. Now, that doesn't mean that this young man who stole my phone didn't have consequences to suffer. And oftentimes, those consequences are set up in our own lives. You know, God doesn't really need to punish somebody who's taken drugs. There's enough hell in their lives already. If you steal something and, and end up in trouble with the law, those are the consequences. He was suffering consequences. He had consequences already at the Jefferson house. But it did mean that I would have offered my forgiveness. I wanted to look him in the eye and say, I forgive you. You want to stop being a screw-up. Let's work on this together. We could have stood side by side as he suffered those consequences. And I could have been there offering prayers and support and friendship. Because that's what grace is. Standing with and forgiving those who are suffering the consequences of their trespasses. Even when those trespasses are against us. Does that sound familiar at all? Have you said that? Are you really willing to live it out? Because it's that moment in the, in the Lord's Prayer that we're asking God to show us grace for our sins so that we might be able to show grace for those who sin against us. We've all received the fullness of that grace that God possesses in the person of Jesus Christ. Grace in place of grace in place of grace in place of grace. We didn't earn it. We can't buy it. We can't say something to make it happen. It's, it, it just exists. It's just given to us. And in Romans 5, Paul says it's in this grace we stand. It's in this grace that we live. It's in this very grace that we exist. This is where we are. And living in the light of this truth is the very heart of discipleship. We exist because of grace. We do not suffer eternal death because of grace. And that same gift is there for each and every one. We've talked a little bit before, it's been a while ago, about what it took to become a disciple in Jesus' day. Disciples lived with their rabbi. They lived with their teacher. They lived every moment of every day with that person so that they didn't just know what the rabbi knew. They didn't know, just know what the teacher taught them. If all you're doing is coming to learn what Pastor Richard or I or someone else is teaching you, then you're missing half of the point. Disciples strove to become what the rabbi was. To learn to live the way he lived. To follow a way of life. Not just to have knowledge. But in our time, and I think it's probably been exactly the same throughout history, I suspect that we have many who want to know the truth, and so they study the Scriptures because they want to know what the rabbi knows. That's, that's normal. If you're a Christian, I want to know what Jesus knows. I want to know what Jesus said. Oftentimes I hear people say, we have to be in the Word. We just have to be in the Word. And we do. We have to be in the Word. But knowing who Jesus was and how He lived His life and how grace affected everyone around Him is also equally, and I think sometimes even more important, 
If we don't know how to put that knowledge into practice, it's not a lot of good. If we only know about Jesus apart from His grace and apart from practicing His grace, then we know, I think, less than half of who Jesus is. John 5, 39 and 40 says, You study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very Scriptures that testify about Me, yet you refuse to come to Me to have life. Jesus Himself says, you look in the Scriptures, you know what the Scriptures say, but if you never come to Me, if you never learn about My life and about the way that I'm living, you can't find life. Because Scriptures testify about Him and about what He did and about how He loved people and about how that love changed the world. So be in Scripture. But that's half of it. The other half is, is going out and living that Scripture. Grace comes constantly to us because we've believed the truth of the Gospel, which gives testimony to the gracious life of Jesus, a life that we're trying to emulate. It was grace that saved a sinful woman at the well, and then eventually brought salvation to that entire community, not only to her, but through her, the entire community. It was grace that saved a wee little man who was detested by everyone. It was grace that spared the life of a woman who was caught in adultery that men who knew the Scriptures, they knew the truth, were going to murder. They knew the truth, but they had no grace. And so they were going to stone her. And the man got off scot-free, apparently. It was grace who saved that woman's life. It was grace that reached down and grabbed the face of a bleeding woman and brought her up and healed her, and forgave her, and loved her. It was grace that healed nine ungrateful lepers. One leper came back and said, thanks, the other nine took off. And Jesus didn't say, well, because you didn't tell me thank you, I'm going to take that healing back. That's grace. Even though that kid has never come to me and apologized for stealing my phone, I love him, and I care about his future. Jesus cared about these nine lepers, even though they didn't really seemingly care about the healing. That was grace. It was grace especially that prayed for religious leaders as they were nailing Jesus to a tree. Stop for a second and think about that. If someone is in your house murdering you, do you have the ability to say, God forgive them because they don't know what they're doing? I don't think I do. I would hope that I do, but I don't know if I do. That's grace. It's grace that restored Peter to the church. And grace is enough to change the life of the poorest person to the richest, the most intelligent to the most simple-minded, the most powerful person to the weakest person, the most famous to the least known, and the kindest person to the most wicked, vile person on death row. Grace changes lives. If we're going to be effective in discipleship, in growing the church, in seeing lives changed, we have to be better living in the light of grace. And that starts right here. There are people in this church, I know, that need to extend grace to one another. People that need to extend love to one another. And how do we expect people to come in if we can't even give grace to ourselves? We've been a part of the church for years and we've been trained in truth. But we have to choose in our hearts to know grace. Romans 1 lists all sorts of traits that stand in the way of grace. A few of them, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, which Jesus defines as just hating someone. If you hate someone, you've murdered them. Those who love to argue, deceitful, whisperers, backbiters, those who are proud, inventors of evil things, liars, people with natural, without natural affection, just the ability to love and have empathy, empathy for other people, ruthless people and unmerciful people. But grace, on the other hand, takes the knowledge that you've gained, which is truth, and it writes that truth on your heart. And it, and it takes it from here to here. It makes it less about knowledge and more about a life. Instead of a gospel being words that you recite, it becomes a way of life that gives your existence an entirely new meaning. Grace reminds me and it reminds you that I am a sinner and even at the worst days in my life, I want someone to forgive me and I want somebody to walk alongside me. 
So that when someone else is at their worst, like this young man, when he's having his worst day, I have the ability, just like Jesus, to love him and to walk beside him no matter what he's done. And when we do that for somebody who doesn't know Jesus, that's who Jesus becomes to them. If we're hateful and angry and wrathful to people, that's who Jesus is. If we're gracious and loving, as the Scripture says, people will know that I am the Son of God because I am love and you're showing them that. So when we do that for someone who doesn't know Jesus, that's who Jesus becomes to them. Truth, hope, love, empathy, compassion, grace. Someone who gives unmerited favor in the face of sin. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how sin is defeated. Sin is defeated when grace abounds. Just as darkness is an absence of light, sin is an absence of love and grace. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. God was concerned about people. And so He sent Jesus to pitch His tent among us. We label people. God doesn't label people. He's concerned about showing grace to people that society throws away. In Jesus, we were given grace upon grace. But like all of God's blessings, we're meant to learn from them. We're meant to practice them. So the important question for us this morning, the important question for me, and I asked this question when I preached about this, I think at Christmas uh, a year and a half ago. But is God's grace living in my heart? Is God's grace living in your heart? Is God's grace living in this church? When God's grace is written on our hearts, it changes our lives. It turns everything upside down and we begin to see people and we begin to see the world differently. We don't listen to the news. We don't listen to what other people have to say. We look at people through the lens of Jesus Christ as given by God. For me, my life can easily be summarized by what I was like before I found grace and understood the concept of grace. And after I found out about grace, my theology is different, my teachings are different, the way I deal with people are different. And I was saying to, uh, when we had kind of a staff meeting the other day, and I was saying that I wholeheartedly believe that this is why young people leave the church in droves after they leave home, because they've been trained in Scripture. I said, I hate the word trained. I understand it, but I hate it, because they've been trained in Scripture. They know the truth. They know what the Bible has to say, but they've never been taught the grace of Jesus. And they have a hard time putting that truth into practice, because it's separate from grace. Because grace is the story of the Gospel, the grace for God, of God for humanity and the person of Jesus. And following Jesus isn't an exercise in knowledge. It's not about having the right knowledge because getting knowledge is easy. All of us can read a book. All of us can watch a video or, or listen to a tape. That's easy. But love... Showing grace to sinners, walking alongside a murderer. Saul. Saul was a murderer. Yet he changed the Gentile world because Jesus walked alongside of him. Walking alongside of a murderer. Showing love to a little screw up who stole your cell phone and helping him to discover that he was never a screw up to start with. That's his own label. He's loved by the living God. And even in the light of what he did, grace is available to him. That's hard. Knowledge is easy. Loving people in the midst of, of sin is hard. Love is hard. Grace is hard. Much, much more difficult than memorizing and reciting verses. But love and grace is the only way that Jesus said we could make people believe. If we want this church to grow, if we want to disciple, if we want to see lives changed, we have to learn love and grace. Decide in our hearts today 
that we are going to not only accept grace upon grace, but that we are willing to give grace upon grace. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the grace that you have given to me. Lord, I'm reminded oftentimes of the grace that I was given for little things, for big things. God, you know there are consequences. But you're always there with grace. So help us to dispense grace in the same way that you do. To love and to care for people because we want to see lives changed. Because we want to see people experience your very presence, your existence, what you're all about. And we want people to know that you are the kind of God who would leave the heavenly realms and pitch your tent among us because we couldn't save ourselves. You're the kind of God that prays for people that are killing you. You're the kind of God that walks alongside murderers. You're the kind of God that forgives even when forgiveness isn't necessarily being sought. We saw it in the religious leaders. We saw it in the lepers. God, those stories are crazy to us because they're hard for us to do. But if we're going to be like you, if we're going to represent you well, your gospel turns all of our notions about right and wrong on their heads. And so make us, make us desire to seek your way and to live that way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, if you have any reason to come forward, if you want to join the church, if you'd like to be baptized, um, if you just need prayer, Pastor Richard will be up here, I'll be up here as we sing a, a very familiar song, uh, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And again, don't just sing the song, read the words. Is it a commitment? Is it something you've truly done? If not, come forward and we would love to pray for you. Please turn in your hymnals to number 602 as we sing together, I have decided to follow Jesus. Would you turn on the mic? Thank you. Okay. Before you go, before we have the benediction, I just want to share something with you because it's kind of on your way out and you'll remember that way. Um, Grandparents' Day is coming in September. Do you know that? You guys know about Grandparents' Day, right? It's the second Sunday in September. Um, we are going to put together an opportunity to help reach out to your families. 
to your kids and grandkids if you have some that don't come to church. We are going to have a special dinner to celebrate and honor our grandparents among us, and we want to be able to invite those children and grandchildren you have in the community, especially those who are not part of a church. Um, and if you don't have a grandchild here, you'd like to kind of have an adopted one or the neighbor kid, that's fine. But we want to invite them, not you. And so what we, you're gonna, you'll find out more about this over time, but uh, we kind of want some lead time, and I thought I'd give you advance warning, and maybe somebody may be here, may not be here later. There's some papers in the back, just little blank papers there. You can write down names and addresses of people you would like us to invite. Uh, from your family and leave it back there. We'll pick them up. Or you can call the church office let us know. But we're going to have a special thing to, as an outreach to, to help reach out to your own families, the people that you love who, who aren't part of a church, to come and join with us in celebrating you as grandparents. So just kind of file that away. Start thinking about who you'd like to know. We'll get more details to you next week. Okay? Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this day we thank you for sharing your love with us Lord we thank you for encouraging us and speaking to us that we might leave this place and be able to share that love with others God fill our hearts to overflowing with your presence so that there's more than enough for us and more than enough for each person that we come into contact with change our hearts and our minds that we might be good representatives of you to the world and now as you leave this place, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may you share that grace with others. May the Lord turn his favor towards each and every one of you. And may he give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen.